Welcome everybody to our virtual alumni event. My name is Tatin Rauch. I'm the president of the Columbia University Club of Germany and a graduate of the Business School 2002. I'm happy that you are all here tonight with us and I want you to panic. So far this year, we had in Europe heat waves of up to 47 or even 50 degrees Celsius in the south of Europe, in Italy, in Spain, in Greece, in Cyprus. We had wildfires damaging and destroying huge areas in the south of Europe. Uh, just today, a wildfire in Spain was extinguished after one week of burning, and that with the help of uh, lots of rain falling down. And we had severe rainfalls and floodings across many countries in Europe with lethal outcome in Germany for 180 people and in Belgium for 41 people. Other continents, same picture, also droughts and hurricanes. Just the flooding in Germany will cost over 30 billion euros to repair the damages. The US last year had damages from climate events of almost a hundred billion dollars. So humanity is facing a crisis like no other. We have to do something. We cannot afford not to do something in every aspect. Is this a mission impossible? No, but it's a critical mission. And that's why Colombia is on a critical mission. Columbia University is a global leader in climate research and in applied climate and earth sciences. And now the university has founded a new school, the first in 25 years, the Columbia Climate School, to confront the immense challenges of the climate change and the climate crisis. I have the great pleasure to welcome tonight with us the founding dean of Columbia Climate School, Alex N. Halliday. Professor in Columbia University's Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences and Director of the Earth Institute. In April 2018, Columbia University convinced him to leave the University of Oxford and to come to New York. He had been Dean of Science and Engineering there and uh, now he's leading the new Columbia climate effort. Professor Halliday has looked with his research into the birth and early development of, sol of our solar system, the interior workings of the Earth and the processes that affect the Earth's surface environment. And he has been using mass spectrometry in a pioneering way to measure small isotopic variations in everything from meteorites to seawater to living organisms. He has published 400 research papers, has received numerous awards, and Queen Elizabeth has made him a knight of the UK for his services to science and innovation. He has held leading positions in many distinguished scientific societies and advisory panels. I won't list them all now because we'd rather hear from him directly what he has to say to us. So we are very happy to have this distinguished scientist at Columbia and tonight with us. So welcome Professor Halliday. This evening, we are connecting New York with Europe through Brussels. How else could it be? So I'd like to welcome fellow alum Rick Zetnik, Journalism 94, who joins us from Brussels. Rick is a former journalist and longtime media executive he has been the CEO of Media Network Euractive, now the vice chair of the board. He has been also the managing director of Women Political Leaders, now secretary of the board. He has been in a leading position at the Wall Street Journal Europe and co-founder of the Slovak Spectator. And he has been published in many publications like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal and the Columbia Journalism Review. Rick will be discussing tonight with Professor Halliday our planet's future and the contribution of Columbia Climate School. We will have a Q&A following and many of you have pre-submitted questions, so thank you for that. And you can always submit your questions starting now by using the chat function of Zoom. So now 
I want you to be optimistic and to listen to the scientist. Over to you, Rick. Thank you, Tatine, very much. And um, it's, it's an honor and uh, I'm excited to be doing this event this evening. Um, I want to, Tatine, thank you very much also for initiating this important discussion. Um, and it's a great evening to have people joining us, as I understand, not just from across Europe, but also beyond and representing uh, all or nearly all of Columbia's schools. Uh, so it's really, it's really a great collaborative effort of the Alumni Association. So thanks, thanks for everybody involved for that. Alex, I am eager to get into it. And I want to start by saying this is, as, as Tatin said, she wants us to panic. This is not abstract. This is personal. And I think for you more than for most. And I'm interested to hear from you to start our discussion. Growing up in the tin and copper country of Cornwall, what drew you? to this field, uh, which has now led you to be founding dean of Columbia's Climate School. Ah, well, thank you very much, Rick, and thank you for the introduction to Teen. It was really nice, thank you. Um, so I started off, I, I moved down to Cornwall when I was a kid because I had bad health and they thought that uh, Cornwall would be better for, me, better for me than living next to where they were building the M1 motorway. Um, so I ended up um, growing up with my aunt who actually couldn't think of what to do with me. So she took me out on mine dumps, collecting minerals at weekends. She thought that's what every young kid would probably want to do. So I became very interested in mineral deposits and geology, and in particular wanted to get involved in something useful with my life. So I decided I really wanted to become an economic geologist of one sort or another. Uh, th those of you who know the geology of Cornwall might know that it's pretty much all finished about 260 million years ago. Um, there's some, there are some slates and sandstones and things like that, no fossils in them at all. There's granites, there's some ultramafic rocks and the beautiful lizard, lizard uh, uh, peninsula. But actually, there's nothing much else. Um, and then when I was going to university at the age of, uh, in 1970, um, someone announced the discovery of some fossils that were Pliocene in age, which is three million years ago. And at the time, it was quite exciting. There were these sand deposits that people realized were actually located 40 meters above sea level. And um, this seemed you know, remarkable. And they realized actually the land must have gone up and down. And so you had this view of Cornwall, actually like most geology, as being as something very stable that just went up and down with time, just like the rest of the world. And you thought of it very much in terms of how the world works in terms of the underlying forces of the earth. Nowadays, we know that 3 million years ago, there was 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. It's the last time we had that. And the reason why we had those have those fossils at that elevation is because sea level was much higher at that time. So my journey through science has gone from being fascinated by geology and then getting into the studying the early solar system to actually realizing increasingly that I could work on the recent history of the Earth realizing how interesting it was, but then realizing how important it really was. And I think when I moved to Oxford and I ended up becoming Dean of Science and Engineering, I really decided that I wanted to build um, interdisciplinary networks on the environment, and in particular to look at climate and energy, uh, but also biodiversity. And then I worked for the Royal Society and actually tried to do work with my colleagues in social sciences. Uh, Nick Stern, the Lord Stern was the the famous economist, climate economist, um, was president of the British Academy at the time. So he and I worked together on these issues of climate change and it became more and more important to me. And if you like, one of the most transformative things for me was the Paris Climate Accord, when I actually realized that there was this fantastic agreement to do something about climate change. And yet it just left people reeling, thinking how on earth are we gonna get there? And you realize that this is the most important thing you could possibly get involved in working on. So when I was asked to come to Columbia to work at the Earth Institute, I said I will very happily come to Columbia and be a part of the Earth Institute, lead it, help to take Columbia forward. But I really want to focus on climate uh, because I see that as such an important thing. And the university was very enthusiastic to move in that direction. So with leadership from Columbia and with me joining them, we've been working together to move Columbia in that direction. 
Excellent. Thank you for, for sharing the roots of your interest in, in the area and how it has brought you to Columbia. Columbia is very fortunate to have attracted you. I'm interested if you can um, talk, talk also now to set the scene for the discussion about this moment. You, you talked about the Paris Accord and that is already starting to fade a little bit into the, into the, into the memory for some people. So scientists agree the next 10 years are crucial can you help us understand just how urgent the problem is? So <clears throat> while we want to focus on the present, I want to just lay the, the whole history out. Because New York, if you went to New York, you should be very proud because the first person to do experiments on CO2 and gases and actually realize that there would be global warming uh, was actually based in uh, New York, in New York State. Um, and it was a woman, Eunice Foote from Seneca Falls, uh, who basically produced the first paper. She gave, gave the first demonstration of this. And um, uh, later other people uh, got involved in this, particularly in Europe. Uh, but it wasn't until about the 1970s when Wally Broker at Columbia um, figured out that actually there was such a thing as rapid climate change from looking at ice core records and and some marine, rec uh, marine records in those days, sorry, um, that showed that we came out of the ice ages very fast and you realize climate can change really fast, that he realized we were on the edge of a big global warming. He published, he was the first person to use global warming in the scientific literature in the mid seventies. But then Jim Hansen, who was also at Columbia, head of NASA GIS, uh, was reported to Congress that actually it's already started. And the thing I want to, convey is that in those days we realized this was going to be serious but I don't think even the scientists even the climate scientists realized how serious it was going to be and now we know that this is an incredibly difficult problem uh, that is potentially going to be much worse than we thought but it's also a wicked problem that is going to be amazingly hard to solve so I think the the key thing about um, uh, the evidence base for that is that we now know that the ice sheets are melting much faster. Uh, the ice sheets in Antarctica are melting much faster. The ice sheets in uh, Greenland are melting. Um, they're producing as much um, runoff into the oceans as the ones of the, from the whole of Antarctica because Greenland is warming up really, really fast. And, uh, but on top of that, we've got the evidence of massive drought in the Western US. Again, Columbia scientists have shown this is the worst drought for at least a thousand years. It, and we're not through it yet, so it could be worse than the 1,000 1, years. They use tree ring records to show that. And, you know, we talk about the wildfires, we talk about the rev reservoirs going down, but actually nobody says, well, hang on, where is this going? When is it going to end? And, and so people are beginning to realize this is, we're seeing phenomena that we just hadn't got used to before. We're seeing massive rainfall, starting with Hurricane Harvey, of course, but then we saw it in Germany. We've just seen it in New York, where we had uh, Hurricane ha uh, Ida leaving um, three inches of rain in one hour on Central Park. Three inches of rain. There's no infrastructure in the world that can sustain this. It's just, we're just not built for that kind of thing. And the amazing thing is it came 10 days after Hurricane Henry actually delivered the previous record, just 10 days. So this is changing very fast. It's massively serious and we're too late. And at the same time, there are things we can do. Uh, we should actually be getting galvanizing support to actually do more and more. And of course the financial industry, businesses, they're starting, the city is starting to get it. And so the opportunity is to actually make things happen now at a very fast speed. So you've touched on several things there. We're gonna we're gonna come back to several of those um, about the roles of government, the roles of the private sector. I want to uh, start though with the role of academia. You talk about you know what can we do to to solve this wicked problem, and um, obviously Columbia is pioneering with the establishment, the foundation of this climate school, first of its kind. How is the climate school going to be different? How is it going to be unique? Yeah, good question. So I think the so I, earlier I talked to you about the science and Columbia is fantastic in the science. We have more climate scientists than any other university in the world because we've got the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory as well as another 20 centers for the Earth Institute, many of them focused on climate. 
and so we've got phenomenal firepower in the science and we're, we're doing we've just been awarded a new uh, 25 million dollar grant from national science foundation for using uh, artificial intelligence to actually improve climate modeling fantastic piece of work that's going on between engineering and and uh, the geosciences so this is there are wonderful ways in which we can do things better with the science but the problem is this is not actually about the science you actually science is important we need to know what the future is going to look like we the better we can do that the better uh, the more we can do that the better but the fact is we need to build resilience we need to figure out new ways of constructing things we need to new buildings new sea defenses we need to figure out how to decarbonize this is a, these are massive engineering issues um, but then they also involve people's hearts and minds and decision making and po pol politics we know that in america climate became incredibly political as an issue and it doesn't need to be it didn't used to be that way in certain parts uh, including in america um, but it became that way and you can see how it could become political in the future as well and so there are how do we actually um, get people to think about this in terms of global governance and responsibility so we all work together to tackle this problem while worrying about our own political constituencies and that we could be voted out of office, you know, according, depending on what we come up with, is one of the biggest challenges we face. The other thing is that, which we'll come on to in a minute, I expect, is that there are huge social justice implications of climate change. And we have to think about this in terms of the impact on people's lives uh, and the, uh, not just in terms of their health and well being. Um, but also in terms of their human rights and how do we look after people who can no longer survive in the in the place they've grown up in. So there's there are massive issues there which are, go well beyond the science. So that's why we need the climate school. It brings all these things together to deliver solutions. And if we, you know, if we basically, um, if we do the science and publish lots of great papers, that's great. Or or whatever. If we produce a lot of fantastic new graduates and new leaders, that's fantastic. But our view is that we will have failed if we don't come up with some solutions that can actually help the world get through this very, very difficult time going forward. Because we're so strong, because we're in New York City in particular, we should actually be leading on this and providing leadership to the world. So it's the, it's the location in New York, which is obviously unique. It's the dis interdisciplinary nature of it. These are a couple of things I'm hearing from you. And, and talking about the interdisciplinary nature, we've got um, folks who I think uh, with backgrounds in law and in business and in um, uh, people of public, international public affairs, SEPA graduates I'm thinking of, range of people on this, on this uh, call. I'm sure will be interested to hear about it, um, not only as a science problem, which it clearly is, but also we've talked about it as a, as a sort of a political social justice issue. We're focusing this evening on Europe and uh, for a largely European audience. So want to talk a little bit about the cooperation. I think Tatiana you touched on the transatlantic nature of the cooperation that's necessary for tackling this. And specifically about Europe as a political and a policy leader on climate. There is now the European Green Deal. I know you were you were quick to praise it um, when it was first first uh, coming out, first emerging. And so I'm eager to hear what makes you optimistic or what makes you concerned about what you're hearing from the European policy makers at, so far. Okay. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that the. Um, Europe is not alone in the sense that um, we've had such a difficult time politically. And now we've come out of that to some extent with the election of Joe Biden. And you know, with Kerry being put in a strong position to lead climate negotiations, um, but also the, the fact that he is actually uh, deeply um, involved in the issue of national security for the United States. That says something about how serious America is now taking this. And it's very striking how fast Biden has been pushing to try and build up um, the work that needs to go on on climate change nationally. So now you've got a potential for a partner in Europe. And I think that partnership has to be very, very strong. I don't think America can do this on its own. And I don't think Europe can do it on its own. But if you actually have a transatlantic partnership, I think it can be immensely powerful. 
Um, and then, of course, there's China. And you've got to think about how are we going to bring China into it? And that's a massively important issue um, that's, of course, we're looking for progress on. And, and there are sort of signs that maybe that's, that's on its way. Um, so in terms of what Europe does itself, I think it's been, it's been demonstrating great leadership um, in terms of thinking about how do we work together on this in a way that has been quite tricky for um, some other places. Um, Europe is such a powerful block that whatever they do, it will have major consequences. And their proposals for things like putting up border taxes that are related to carbon emissions is really interesting. You say, well, okay, well, how's that going to work? Well, it could well actually mean that companies think about changing their product line. Uh, it could be that actually they start to, because they want to export to Europe or whatever. So there are ways in which you can exert quite, I wouldn't call it soft power, I think quite hard power to actually make things happen as a result of the European policies. They've come up with this, um, Europe's come up with, have, have gone beyond their original stuff around the European Green Deal and proposed this Fit for 55 climate package, which is, for those of you who don't know, is um, the EU aims to cut emissions by 55% by 2030, which is fantastic, reaching net zero by 2050. So they've come up with legislative proposals for this, which is great. Uh, but I think one of the important things they've done, that they've recognized they need to work on um, bring in emissions tradings for the building and transportation uh, sectors. Um, but they've also focused heavily on achieving a socially just transition. And that's gonna be really, really important from the point of view of certain communities within Europe that need to be, that are gonna feel the effects of increasing gasoline prices or closing down of coal mines or whatever it is. Um, you know, certain companies that are no longer going to be able to sell what they sell. All of these things are going to be um, thought about in a new way. And they originally had a thing called a just transition fund. Um, but now they've actually decided to delegate money through a social climate fund to individual countries so that they can actually think at the granular level about what do they need to do to transition their own societies. Because ultimately, that's where the political that's where the rubber hits the road in terms of politics. If you can't make it work in a particular country, then you're stuck. So I think they've been brilliant at thinking about this. I don't think they've got all the solutions yet, but I think it's wonderful that they are moving these directions. And you touched on some of the uh, communities, some of the constituencies who uh, will be difficult to bring along. Um, you didn't mention specifically the Gilets Jaunes, but you talked about you know, fuel prices. Um, so there was an example, obviously, here in Europe, where there was a government trying to make difficult decisions, the kinds of things that are going to be necessary, and there was resistance. Um, you know, Germany has an election coming up uh, later this month, and there is, it's actually looking quite um, unclear what government is going to emerge from that. But I think that the flooding that happened this summer uh, Tatin touched on that and how that has become brought climate right to the forefront of the political debate in Germany. I'm just interested to hear you sort of comment on, you know, do you think that the political will is there in Europe to make the difficult decisions that are going to be necessary? So I think, um, I think this is a, it's a truly important question. I think the media can do a lot to really help in this front. I'm, of course, I'm talking to you, Rick, you, you're the expert here. But it strikes me that the media has a very important role to play in terms of, um, you know, raising the profile of certain issues with the politicians who are being elected. And if they focus on, you know, who's going to lower their, who's going to have the lowest fuel prices, then they're kind of missing the point. You know, if they are really just going to focus on that, and they're going to get elected because they're actually going to have cheaper fuel prices, then I don't think that's going to, going to help us with the transition. But if instead they can actually focus on uh, the issues of what are we going to do to get out of this mess that's, that's only just started and it's going to get much worse in the future. And actually, how do we prepare society in a better way? How do we actually uh, focus on those sectors that are going to be particularly impacted and help them 
provide them with the financial support to move in the right direction then I think that's actually does really push the politicians to think hard about um, what are the really important issues that people need to be focused on right now. I'm not saying that fuel prices aren't important and I'm not saying you shouldn't apply some kind of um, um, special progressive tax to actually make sure that, that that has less of an impact. But nonetheless, I do think that raising the level of discussion is really important so that people recognize how immensely serious this is going to be for Germany going forward. I'm hoping that um, the journalism school will be wise enough to have you speak at every to every class that comes through once a year at least to convince right. the these emerging the emerging journalists to hear your perspective on that because I think it's I think it's fundamentally important. Um, okay. Sticking with Europe and, and, and policy just for a moment more on so COP26 in Glasgow in November. Yeah. What, what, what is your hope for what needs to come out of, of COP26? Um, right, so I think there are, there are the usual things which aren't unimportant because they're usual. So the, you know, there are the issues about how to accelerate emissions reductions. How are you gonna to get to 1.5 degrees? What's, what's it really gonna look like? And everyone's got to think about that because it's fine to make these big pronouncements, including what's in the European Green Deal. But how are you really going to make that happen? What's the, what's the roadmap for doing that? And getting countries to compare notes on how they're doing that, I think, will be immensely helpful. And getting people to think about what do we do between countries to make it work better, I think, is also going to be really important. So I think you could say that one of the, one of the overriding things we've just got to do is to phase out coal. Coal is, you know, you know, you know, coal in America, which is declining anyway, coal in India, coal in China, but also in a number of other places is actually providing a lot of the fuel that's needed for countries to develop. And, and so how do we phase that out? That's got that that is such a those are big numbers that could make a big difference or a significant difference to the problem. That's not all of it. There's plenty more to do. But getting some agreement on how we're going to progress that, um, and in particular helping the developing countries. Of course, we call China a developing country still. So, um, but um, you know, how do we actually do that? I think is going to be massively important. I think um, how do we uh, develop a? How do we you know trying to get sort of more informed decisions about financial incentives, and uh, how do you actually get? in particular um, support for transition in developing countries uh, where like they need to transition, but it's really hard for them. Um, how do you actually get investment in the um, zero carbon economy? How do you actually get money being trillions of dollars of capital getting in the right place, which is behind a lot of the more innovative um, solutions that are needed for tackling the climate crisis? How do you get investment in the research that's really needed globally? And then how do you get people to work together? But there are also, well, talking about working together, there's also the issue of global governance. So how do you actually decide who's in charge of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? And can they make money out of it? And how do you pay for it? And so all of these things that we're looking for in terms of future uh, technologies to help reduce CO2 in the atmosphere, they're gonna require some understanding of global governance. And then there's this issue, I think, of adaptation. How do we help countries that are going to be massively impacted by climate change um, because of sea level change and because of um, the, uh, the impacts in particular on uh, certain communities being so severe that effectively their island or their coastal community, or maybe just where they happen to live, where it's incredibly hot, become uninhabitable. What's going to be the situation in terms of governance and responsibility and human rights? We have, we have a very good framework for refugees who are refugees from war. We don't, we're not quite there yet in terms of refugees from climate. But it's not even just a question of refugees. It's a question of how do you deal within the United States or in other parts of um, other big countries <clears throat> with the fact that certain people are no longer going to be able to live within that part of the country and they're gonna to have to move to other areas. So there's so much thinking that's gotta go on on that front where you think countries should be exchanging ideas and, 
and offering ideas for how we could set a framework that might actually help. You, you were talking about getting the proper incentives and um, it's, it's not that there is a lack of funding is what I'm part of what I'm hearing from you. It's a question of, of the incentives and how do we get the markets to incentivize the kind of change that is necessary. And so what is, what is your sense these days of, of the markets? Are they, are they preparing themselves for a green economy? And when I talk about the markets, there's the financial markets, but it's also touches on major industries, energy, automotive, oil and gas um, sector. Are, are, they, are they incentivized sufficiently? And, and if not yet, what is it going to take? So I think there are, well, the first thing it needs is, is infrastructure. So I think the most, most of the major automotive car, uh, most automotive industry is ready to switch to electric vehicles, for example. And they've got ideas for how to do that, that some of them are already starting. But, you know, where are you going to charge your car in New York City and this kind of stuff? It's kind of pretty, pretty basic stuff. And um, different cities are tackling this in a different way. And it's great to see it in certain places. But we need real leadership around setting up the right kind of infrastructure so that the automotive industry really says, yes, I can sell cars like this if I, if I do it. But the second thing is that some of these products, some of these cars are actually going to be more expensive to produce for a variety of reasons. Some are going to involve a lot of technical development and huge investment. But even then, there's going to be a situation, I think, where we're going to see uh, certain places, um, certain companies look at their profit margins and realize they're simply not going to make as much money as they did in the past. I, I, you know, if they try charging more for the car, they won't get the market. So they recognize they're going to make less money from cars. So companies are thinking about what else they can do. Um, just like oil and gas companies are thinking about what else they can do and how can they move and become major energy companies in the future. Same with automotive companies. And some automotive companies are thinking about how do they actually focus on what society will look like in the future and invest in particular in things like um, understanding software and data and uh, understanding how um, automation, uh, automobiles will be operating in the future uh, within a city framework, all those kinds of interesting areas. So there's a, there's a lot of, it's creating incentives for interesting creative thinking about in companies who see the writing on the wall. wall. They're way ahead of many people. They do understand this is the way it's gonna have to go. And they're thinking creatively about moving into other areas. And you're but, talking about so creative, creative thinking, but also it sounded to me like you were talking a little bit about being willing to accept perhaps smaller profits. Um, and is that, I mean, we can talk about it in terms of business and, and, and the management of expectations to of business shareholders. What about on the consumer side? So is this something that, is, is this a problem of consumption? Is this something where all of us need to think a little bit more about uh, how our own, you know, consumption patterns and habits? Well, I think that there's a certain amount of um, people speaking up, and particularly young people, of course, um, which has had a huge influence. And I think people didn't realize just how influential that might be. <laughs> and it partly relates to the fact that the, um, you know, it partly relates to the fact that this is the biggest intergenerational human rights issue we've ever faced, that actually society is going to be having to deal with this for decades ahead. And it's the young people and their children who are gonna be bearing the brunt of this. And so hearing young people talk about it actually does carry a certain amount of, um, it resonates with people. Actually, this is, you know, so I do think that there's, there are certain ways in which um, people are speaking out partly because the fact they realize this is something that future generations are really gonna have to, to deal with. So I think there are choices that you can make about that. Um, and I think the best choice you can make is, to, you know, is when you vote and think about you know, what are you going to do in terms of which person are you going to vote for in the election? 
Uh, but it's also true in terms of which products you go with or what kind of um, what kind of opportunities there are. We just had a situation where the gas went out outside our apartment in New York City, an apartment block owned by Columbia University. It's a really nice block, fantastic, you know, apartments, wonderful. But suddenly there's no gas and the, they try to replace the gas and they, they fix the gas and then they realize they can't pressure test the building adequately. It's going to take ages to fix. And somebody says, well, you know, why don't we, why don't we switch to just electricals? And then you realize actually, of course, the infrastructure isn't quite right. We're going to have to replace more, provide more electrical power. But there's a certain move to, to recognize that we need to choose more sustainable options. And of course, in the midst of all of that, there are people saying, but I like cooking with gas. It's so much more flexible. I really like that way of using, heating things up and I don't want an induction hob or whatever. So, so there are hearts and minds that need to be one in this. And actually they've got to sort of be, somehow people have got to be carried with the sense that this actually really is important for the future. And they've got to make those choices that are gonna help sustain society in the future, not for them, but for other people. We are um, getting to a point now in the conversation where I want uh, our audience to uh, feel free to submit questions. There's a Q&A function in, here in the, in, the, in the platform. So please feel free to submit questions there. I see a couple have come in. I, I want to say we also received, thank you very much to those of you who sent questions in advance. We have quite a number and to be very, Honest, we don't have the time to get to all of them, but good thing is that there are some common interests and we'll be able to group a lot of those questions. So I'm gonna to start to um, call upon some of those questions, first starting with some of the ones we received in advance. Um, but Alex, also before I get to the questions, I'm going to be um, eager for, to hear from you and either now or, or in a few minutes about what is gonna be the one takeaway you want the audience to, to bring with them when this conversation finishes and they you know, go to discuss it with their families or their colleagues or whatever. Is that the kind of thing you'd like to touch on now or should we come back to that? I'm happy to do it now if you like. Yeah, please. Okay. I think the most important thing to say is that getting this right is going to be the most important thing for the next 20 years. We've really got to focus on this, not just for, like I say, for us, but for others. And the science is developing in a wonderful way a good example is sea level change, where we can now, we've now got satellites that can actually see what's gonna happen around coastal regions. And we can recognize that certain parts of the world are gonna be much more severely impacted than others in terms of sea level change. There are some places, I won't go into the details, but there's some places where sea level will actually go down. But what's very striking is that sea level is, um, you know, ice sheet melting is increasing every decade. And the, um, we're now, you know, looking at ice sheet loss from Antarctica that's about um, uh, 10 times what it was 30 or 40 years ago. So this is, we didn't know that before, but now we can actually see it happening and it's happening really fast and Greenland is going even faster. So there are gonna be massive implications and people are going, changing their opinions, scientists are changing their opinions about what this will mean. And it means that actually certain communities, particularly in the, uh, near the equator and the tropics, are gonna be severely impacted, partly by sea level change that is gonna be far worse than we thought, but also from those tropical storms. We thought what happened in Germany was terrible. We see what's happening in rainfall in certain other parts of the world. This is absolutely nothing compared with what will happen in the tropics in the future. And so uh, I think the, I think the right thing to say, as Tatine said at the beginning, is you should be seriously worried about this. I think she put it more strongly than that. You should be frightened about what the future will look like if we don't deal with this. And we've got to get this right. And it's not just that it'll be hard for people. People are now wondering about what will happen to society more generally and whether certain societies will just disintegrate as a result of the impacts of climate change. So this is deadly serious and we've got to be deadly serious about it. You know, um, one thing I find striking uh, speaking with you this evening and, and uh, seeing some of the previous uh, similar talks you've given is that you balance being, and I'm not sure the word alarmist 
comes naturally to you, but I think it's I think it's it's essential to sound the alarm the way you're doing right now, and yet you balance that with an optimism, which is which is encouraging for all of us to think that this is uh, a, a wicked problem. I like that word, and yet it's one that um, it's within our control to manage if we seize it. I think it's fair to say that some people I think are maybe too optimistic, um, and maybe that's the right way to do it to actually make so that people don't give up. They feel, yes, we can do this, but there are huge challenges, you know, and, and when they talked about how we're gonna get to uh, net zero, they're talking about having to develop technologies that don't exist yet for, for, for much of what we need to do. So, okay, so, so I think it is true that if you look back over history, over the last, you know, thousands of years, humanity has actually, develop things to deal with crises over and over again. You might want to see, look at Ruth DeFries's book. She's a Columbia University professor, a book called The Big, the Big Ratchet, and how actually when things went really badly wrong in the past, society figured out how to, to overcome it um, with new solutions. And I am optimistic that we can do this, um, but it does involve new things being developed, which aren't there yet. So one of the questions that we received in advance was, um, if we've not reached the so-called tipping point yet, what effects of climate change are already irrevocably with us? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, and the, um, I think the, so there's two things to say. Once CO2 is in the atmosphere, it hangs around for a very long time. So it gradually, if you took a, if you could imagine there was no CO2 in the atmosphere and you put a pulse of it into the CO2, a uh, pulse of CO2 in the atmosphere, a major fraction of it would still be around even after hundreds of years. So it takes a long time to dissipate. And that's because CO2 has to be taken out of the atmosphere by plants, et cetera, and by absorption into the oceans and uh, et cetera. There's a sort of long-term cycling to this thing. So, um, you know, the net result is that we have this problem as an ongoing problem. If you stopped emitting right now, we would still have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the thermal effects of that and the um, is actually going to, there, there's still going to be issues going on for quite a long time as the, as it re-equilibrates through the ocean system, etc. So that means we've, we've got to, whether we like it or not, we've got to deal with climate adaptation, it's going to be there in the future. If we reach tipping points where, for example, the permafrost melts or we start to affect the um, Gulf Stream or the ocean conveyor in some way, which is uh, the thermohaline circulation, then that might, we're not clear what those effects might be at the moment and how they might develop. There are theories, but they're not very clear. The Gulf Stream moving further south might actually be quite helpful in some ways. So I think there are ways in which we um, we are sort of thinking about um, how this will work, play out, but there's no question that regardless of tipping points, we've got a problem that is gonna be ongoing and getting worse. And at the moment we're, we're sort of increasing the number of amount of CO2 in the atmosphere by PPM every year. It's not going down. And the reason for that, which people need to understand is that we have more renewables than ever before. So a greater fraction of our energy is renewables, but the denominator is also increasing. So people's standards of living are increasing, which is fantastic. They want cars, they want whatever, they want to travel and producing, we're actually utilizing more energy than ever before. And that means that we're actually using more coal. We're using more, we're producing more CO2 than we did in the past, despite the growth of renewables. So that's how hard this problem really is. We've been working on renewables for quite a while now. It's been great to see the change in the price of solar and wind, but we are nowhere near where we need to be in terms of turning the corner on this to actually reduce those emissions. So the questions we've received, I would group, divide them into three groups. There's, there's science questions, there's policy questions, and there's questions specifically about the school. And I wanna to try to touch on the three categories. Just one more on the science right now. And that is, um, there's a question that came in saying, how do you see the emphasis between mitigation and adaptation. So you were talking about a little bit about this already, but is, you know, is the balance struck correctly? Do you, which direction do you see it going in terms of the research, either at Columbia or more broadly? Um, 
that's I, <laughs> so I think um, well both are needed. Uh, so I it's I think in terms of the science, I would say mitigation is by far the most important thing. We've got to figure out how to decarbonize. If you don't get that right, then um, you know, if we can't reduce CO2 in the atmosphere, all the predictions, the IPCC predictions require us to be able to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We can do that today, but the amounts that we can take out are tiny. And we need to be dealing with, uh, at the moment we're, we're producing the equivalent of about 50 gigatons per year of carbon dioxide. Uh, we need to actually remove as much carbon dioxide as if you think of it as occupying pipelines and infrastructure, it's the equivalent of the entire oil and gas industry every year. That's what we've got to be doing. So this is like massive. We've got a huge challenge there. And if we don't get that, the price of doing that down and the ability to actually do that more efficiently down, then we're stuck. And then there are some really exciting opportunities. People are worried about the fact that we're getting so dependent on lithium and batteries and, and re renewable uh, energy being done through uh, electrical storage. So there are other opportunities around the hydrogen economy and the idea of actually using fuel cells and other things that, that require innovation and they could be massively important as well. And then how do you decarbonize manufacturing? How do you decarbonize, which is huge CO2 emissions for ammonia and for producing ammonia, for producing cement and producing steel. How are you gonna get those down? How are you gonna de, what are you gonna do about aviation? These are huge chunks of problems that need to be dealt with. And so that, that whole mitigation thing, I think technologically is arguably by far the most important problem. If you can't solve that, then we're gonna be carrying on in the same old way. On the other hand, I think the issues facing society um, are so much of it is gonna be about how do we change and how do we adapt uh, to build resilience? And part of that is around science, but a lot of it is around, um, you know, what do we need to do in terms of um, people and how people are able to survive in the future. This is going to be a, a massively important humanitarian issue going forward, which is going to involve a lot of, and then of course, there's a whole issue of how do you make decisions? How do you communicate? Why is it that half the, you know, certain proportions of society don't believe in climate change or whatever? So how all those social issues, you can't do it just with science. You've got to actually have social science coming into this psychology um, and things like that. And, and I'm going to shift. There's a question that's come in while we've been speaking. Um, it, it's to me, it sounds like a question back to the questions of global governance. Um, and it touches on the fact, uh, it talks about emergency management in Europe and especially how a lot of the, um, the jurisdiction of these things is drawn along national borders, sometimes even subnational borders. And how do we, how do we make sure that climate, which is obviously a borderless challenge, how do we make sure that we get that cooperation, you know, not just with across countries, but across continents and globally speaking, um, what, do we, what can we do? I mean, it's a very, very big question, but to uh, make sure that the, the politicians who are voted only by their constituents are thinking beyond those borders. So I think there are um, two kinds of things. One is we can provide international agreements like IPCC as, and the things we develop with COP26. Um, so those agreements are really important. Um, and then we need to, so far we've been, um, we've actually relied on the idea of, of countries coming up with their own emission targets. And uh, at some level that's got to carry on working. We've got to put pressure to actually come up with more stringent targets because we're, we're not near where we need to be at the moment. Uh, we've got to, <laughs> The current plans to cut reduce emissions are nothing like what we need to be able to reduce CO2 emissions enough to avoid dangerous global warming. So there's a load more that has to be done. So there's got to be agreements between countries. But I think uh, having major blocks of you know, countries or major countries working together, like China and America working together, or Europe and China and America working together, that could be massively helpful. And I do think that, um, that's, that's going to be hugely important. There are things you can do nationally as well. So the UK has got a, partly because the UK got quite interested in this whole subject quite a while. Actually, Maggie Thatcher got quite interested in this whole subject. 
So there was actually a long his history of interest in the climate and the environment, which put it to the top of the agenda. And uh, they actually came up with um, legally binding mandate upon the UK government to be able to come up with a plan for adaptation. It has to come up with a plan to deal with climate adaptation. Most countries don't have that legally binding agreement in their, in their, in their laws. But that has to be, I think those kinds of things, getting those put into countries so that they realize they've got to come up with something and they will be voted out of office unless they come up with something that is actually binding, I think could be very helpful. Okay, great. Um, just in our last remaining minutes, uh, I want to ask, there's a, some questions about the school. Um, so one of them uh, came across uh, during this discussion, uh, wanting to ask, is there any specific plan on behalf of Columbia Climate School to target, to start a project in Europe? or any strategy to explore interesting projects of cooperation between the school, school and European institutions or perhaps EU member states? So there's, um, I mean, there's, so there's two answers to that. One is that, um, yes, we very much want to partner with others. So we're part, part of an organization which we just joined, which was set up by London School of Economics and Xinhua in China called the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate. And so there, we joined this just a couple of years ago. Um, Berkeley and MIT are in it as well. I think Yale has just joined. Um, in the UK, Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, London School of Economics are in it. In the case of, um, uh, but there are other places throughout Europe who are involved. Sciences Po is in, in this. So, and then of course, London School of Economics and Sciences Po in particular have got a very strong connection to uh, Columbia. So we actually do do joint degrees with Sciences Po. And so there's a there's a phenomenal opportunity there to harness some real intellectual firepower between these organizations to work on some of the issues of climate together. Um, Columbia's got the most outstanding climate science, but at the same time, it doesn't necessarily have, we don't have enough ecology, for example, and I feel we need more people working on ethics and things like this. So there are a number of subjects where I think we've got strength and leadership, law, we've got some amazing work going on in law, a little bit of work on policy. These are things that are going well. I think the policy work is taking off at a tremendous rate, but I think we could, we could do so much more if we partner with other organizations. The second part of the question answer is academics are hired to be brilliant. And when you hire academics, you say, I want the most brilliant academic I can find through this job advert. And then once you hire them, you say, okay, go be brilliant. And that's it, off you go. Nobody's gonna tell you what to do. Nobody's gonna say, you've got to work on this, that, or the other. So you hire the best physical chemist and maybe that physical chemist will develop a new kind of battery, but they might not. So there's a certain problem with academic freedom, which I think is inevitable. It leads to brilliance. It, it led to the development of the lithium ion battery. Um, by uh, you know a guy called John Goodenough, who um, who ended up um, he ended up basically doing this in Oxford, but he then he went to the U.S. and <clears throat> that was just academic brilliance. He was just interested in the subject, you know. And so you want that independence and that freedom to think and and go in a creative, original ways. And at the same time, it makes it quite hard to say, well, how are you going to organize yourself? So the climate school is designed to provide what we call facilitation to get people, to encourage people to work in certain areas together. And the key thing for the climate school is we're, you know, we don't want stuff that you can just do in engineering or just do in, um, in politics or whatever. We want people who will actually work together on problems. So we're setting up these um, sort of grand challenges, um, sort of areas where we want to inject money to actually accelerate change. Uh, one is around decarbonization. One is around sea level change. One is around food security. And the fourth is around um, disaster resilience. And we want people, we're gonna provide opportunities for people to work together. And we're looking to get resources and support to help us build out these programs. And with each one of these, the idea is you work together in a transdisciplinary way, but you also have a focus on delivering solutions to the real world. So that's what it's about. I think it's going to be fantastic. And that's what, why the climate school will be very different from most schools. 
Well, you've, you've uh, made the case very clearly and I, I wanna thank you. Um, we're going to wrap up. I, we have more questions. We're not gonna be able to get to them. Um, I wish we had two or three hours to, to conduct this conversation. Um, Alex, thank you again for this important conversation. It's been a pleasure to speak with someone whose breadth of knowledge is, is uh, just astounding. Um, I wanna say a couple of words before turning it over to Tatine. Um, first of all, obviously climate change is a crisis that impacts all the world, requires a collaborative approach across all fields. We've heard that so clearly from our distinguished speaker, Alex Halliday. Um, and on behalf of Columbia, I wanna thank the donors who support the Columbia Climate School. You've just heard from the founding dean more ways that you can uh, lend your support to the school. Please cons consider supporting the important work that they do on all fronts. Um, it is, they do accept gifts. They can be made at climate.columbia.edu slash support in case you were wondering. <laughs> and um, so they also, they, they host many events about the climate crisis. Um, including important discussion on climate action and the financial sector, which will be on September 23rd with Alex Columbia faculty and Alliance Bernstein. Registration info can be found at climate.columbia.edu. So with that, I thank you again, and I wanna turn it back over to our host, Tatine Rush. Thank you, Rick. Uh, thank you for leading this discussion. And thank you, Alex, Professor Halliday, for giving us your insights, uh, which are frightening, but uh, you are presenting this in such a calm way that uh, makes us still optimistic uh, that we can do it, that we can challenge uh, ourselves to meet these challenges ahead of us. I would also like to thank uh, you, um, the alumni relations in New York at the university, and especially fellow alum Paul Lindbergh, SIPA 21, and the whole team of alumni relations uh, for making this event happen. And I want to thank everybody who participated, who attended, who listened to the science, and who submitted the questions. And I think there's much more that we will do, we will have to do, and we will hear more about climate and about the climate school. So thank you everybody and have a good evening. Goodbye.